quick uh, interview here with uh, Kepler Bradley. Kepler, you've obviously moved into a new position at Claremont. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what your role is at the Claremont Footy Club? Yeah, so um, basically development and welfare officer. So, um, yeah, just trying to help the boys on and off field, whether it be, you know, helping them find a job, study, um, work experience or anything like that, or on the field. So if they want to go to their player tapes, um, you know, anything like that, a bit, bit extra after training, I can... Um, you know, give them some advice and uh, also heavily involved with the 16s. So I was the midfield coach for the 16s development squad. Um, and I think the 14s and 15s start up relatively soon. So I'll have a fair bit to do with them and also with the Colts as well. So every Wednesday I'll go down with the Colts and help them out and um, try and fast track the uh, the young guys, you know, when they need it. And uh, and on top of that, you know, nutrition and stuff like that as well. So I always give them a few hints what they should, should and shouldn't be eating and what they should yep. be looking for and hydration and stuff like that. Okay, so is it mainly you're dealing with the Colts or is it like some of the younger league guys who are playing in there as well who are still maybe trying to get drafted a bit like Mitch McGrubbin did last year with Claremont? Yeah, I'm, he- well, I'm heavily involved with uh, a few of the Albany guys who, who've got a bit of talent. Uh, I don't just hold myself to the guys that may be getting drafted. You know, I'm pretty broad with my... Um, involvement with the Colts especially you know all the players need help at some point in time and um, obviously the guys that are looking to be drafted and, and you know are good enough to be drafted you know when they when they need something or anything like that they come to me and we've certainly identified the guys that you know may be heading in that direction I know who they are and you know I, I do keep tabs on them and, and, and try and fast track them too yeah, I think it's especially important for waffle clubs these days, obviously with money being as tight as it, as it is, obviously getting that money, even if it is a little bit less now from the, from kids getting drafted, I think it's just one of those focus areas really for clubs, particularly waffle clubs, to survive, I suppose. So things that you're doing with the clubs are really important in terms of them being able to uh, generate extra income for them to survive. And absolutely, absolutely. And we, we identify, you know, things they need to work on and things they have worked on. So my job is to make sure that they keep on working on the things that we've identified that they could be good at, but we want them to keep being good at it, whether it be during their vision on, on their tapes and stuff like that or going down to training and helping them. Yeah, that's that's certainly my job. So we don't just tell a kid that he needs to improve and then forget about it. I, I keep, you know, weekly keeping in touch with them and, and, and trying to really force them to, to get better. And, and um, if they get better, we get better as a club and hopefully we do get a few drafted blokes out of it. Absolutely. When you finished at Fremantle last year was talk about going back to West Perth and being a Kingsley boy as a junior and playing your junior footy there and that sort of thing. So it must have been a tough decision. So where do you obviously want to see yourself going in AFL down? Like, is it going back into AFL or do you feel yourself staying a bit more in the waffle system for a while? Um, I've absolutely enjoyed yeah. it you know, at the moment and uh, I, I, um, I really wanted to stay in football. So the job at West Perth wasn't there. So I was, I was really hunting around for for a football job and yeah I, I mean I've had my footy career so that's just a bonus for myself and, and, and Claremont that I can you know get a few extra years out but um, I really wanted the job and they were good enough to give it to me so I'm doing my level three coaching um, accreditation at the, at the moment so this has kind of helped me to, to finish that off and you know I really want to either coach in the waffle one day or um, hopefully make it into some sort of development role at AFL ranks. I mean, I'm not in any rush at all. I, you know, I'll hopefully finish off this year and hopefully play next year as well, but I, I definitely want to be coaching at some sort of level. And how have, you, how have you enjoyed your footy this year? Obviously, you're a little bit more relaxed, obviously, than being out of the AFL system. How are you enjoying it back in just playing in the waffle level with a couple of days of training a week? And Yeah, uh, to be honest with you, I didn't have a pre-season, so the first three or four weeks were pretty hectic for me, just trying to get the match fitness and, you know, get to know my teammates. I wasn't allowed to train with them basically until a week before the season started, so... It made the first three or four weeks tough, and on top of that, we did lose our first four or five games. So, you know, the last three weeks, we've really turned it around as a, as a team, and it's been, uh, you know, enjoyable and what I thought footy would be after, you know, the AFL system. So the last, you know, month's been really enjoyable, and I think the, the, the team's really enjoyed it, and uh, we're playing some really good footy, and, and, you know, that's what it was all about, me to come back here and hopefully give them back to Claremont and, you know, repaying them for, for, for giving me the opportunity. How do you find it? You've seen both sides of the system now. How do you think the alignment system is working in the waffle? Obviously, for Fremantle, aligned with Peel. How do you think? Do you think that was a good move for the AFL clubs? Yep. Um, do you feel, or do you feel it was a good move for the AFL? Do you feel it was better for you as a Fremantle player yep. playing with all of those guys each week, or do you think it was better? The um, you know, I, I definitely think for the young guys getting drafted, it, it is a ben, it is beneficial to go to, to to a team like Peel, and and you know you, you train with your teammates every day, and then they go and get to play with them. 
on the weekend. Not only that, they get to play their game plan that, you know, whenever they are required to, to play AFL, at least they've played that game plan at a lower level. So I do think that, you know, it helps the AFL clubs enormously to have, um, you know, a team like that where they can put all the youngsters that aren't getting a game and they can still practice the same game plan. And, you know, on the flip side of that, it, it can't be too bad for the waffle because, you know, East Perth or Peel haven't won a premiership yet, so it's not as if they're dominating week in, week out. Yeah. Um, and they're certainly not on top of the ladder at, at um, you know, round eight or nine or whatever it is now. So still, you know, East Perth win five or six flags in a row and Peel win five or six flags in a row. I think it's it's pretty much working, you know. And, yeah, I think, uh, obviously, Subiaco are going pretty strong this year, so they're probably the favourites at the moment. But um, I think the alignments are working pretty yeah. fine. I mean... Going back a little bit, he as a junior came out and obviously you won the Lark medal and the Jack Clark medal, you know, Lark medal being the best in the under-18 nationals and then obviously the best waffle player yep. for West Perth. When you were, the draft is probably a little bit a little bit more low-key than it is today. Yeah. yeah. Um, did you speak to most clubs when you like when you were coming out and, and that sort of thing, or did you have always have a feeling Essendon were going to pick you up? Or No, I, uh, to be honest with you, I didn't know I was going to get drafted until about you know, a month month out of the draft, I must have had my head in the sand because I had no idea about, you know, the draft system and, you know, it gets drilled into the young guys at a young age, you know, this, this day and age. But, you know, 10, 11 years ago, um, I really had no idea that I was good enough until about a month before the draft when a few of the teams started knocking. And, yeah, so I, I knew at that stage that I was, you know, I was, I was a chance to get drafted. And I had an interview with quite a, quite a few clubs and they said, you know, you'd go, but you never know when you're going to go or if you're going to go. So um, it was a privilege to go to Essendon and, yeah, and, and uh, you know, play for 11 years was something to be proud of. And you get you go through a few injuries and stuff like that, but you always you always want to play a few few more games than you did. But um, to be honest, you just got to look, look around at the blokes that have done three or four knee reconstructions and um, yeah. you just got to, you know, Thank, thank your lucky stars that you're, uh, you've done what you've done. But especially, I mean, if you look at the average AFL player and he plays two years, if that. Yeah. So, I mean, to play 11 years is um, certainly a, uh, you, know, a, you know, a great, you know, a really solid achievement for yourself. As you said, it's probably a bit frustrating that you weren't able to probably put a full season together really yeah. every year. You sort of got 14, 15 games, whether yeah. it be injury or a bit of form. Where did you think your best position was as a player? Like, if you had a choice... Like now, you played a bit on the wing, you played in defence, you played full forward. Yeah. Where did you think your best footy was played? Uh, I, I thought it was definitely at Fremantle when I um, you know, played forward for majority of the time and then probably played in the ruck for four or five minutes and chopped out with um, Aaron Sanderlands. Um, we had a bit of a, for two or three years there, we had a bit of a good connection together and um, you just got to look at the way they're playing now. With, you know, Zach Clark's pretty much taken that role up and he's and he's playing really exceptionally well and they and, and as a team them two are going really well as well so that really worked for me when I came over to Freo and, and really enjoyed that role and yeah it's it's just it, w- it was good to to finish off a Fremantle you know even though I did do my knee but it was on a high and yeah you know the way I wanted to go out and the way the Freo let me go out um they gave me an extra year when they probably didn't have to and I really tried to repay them back to play at least a couple of games and my hamstring wouldn't wouldn't let me but that's fine and that's yeah. footy and, and we move on. Yeah. Obviously, you, you need, you know, because you were probably playing your best footy towards that, you know, just before you did your knee as a forward, you were kicking like goals and as you said, you had that good sort of, um, you know, combination with Sandler. Do you feel that, do you feel like that knee took it, do you feel you still, if that knee didn't happen, you'd still be playing today or do you think it was probably, I know you talked about the game getting past you probably last year yeah. when you retired. Do you still think if you didn't have that knee injury, you'd oh, still be the, in there? the knee definitely didn't help me. Yeah. Um, but, you know, who, who knows what, it, what could have happened. I was playing pretty good footy when, when my knee happened and then just a year out of the game and, and trying to come back and my hamstring was never really 100% last year and, um, you know, I'd go to the AFL games um, on the weekends and watch the boys play and just think, you know, the, the game's past me, as you said. So I dare say if I hadn't done my knee, I, I, you know, I might have got a few more games, yeah. but y- you never know. And, uh, yeah, I was just happy to, to play the, the amount of games I did and hopefully for the fans and that out there, they, they agree that I, I gave it 100%. Yeah, absolutely. I, as a Fremantle supporter myself, did you sort of pick up on the fact that you had that sort of big cult-like status at Fremantle? Like, you know, I know I was a bit, you know, a bit laughing about it, but obviously, yeah. like, you know, it's sort of like, as a, you know, everyone, all the Frio fans had a soft spot for yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, no, it was, it was, I've come, up, come across from Essendon and I, I reckon they had a different opinion, but it was just, you know, it was good for me uh, after seven years, um, especially, you know, three or four years into my seven years, 
I, I could notice the, the crowd was, was turning and, and, you know, they kind of appreciated what I was what I was doing. I don't do everything, you know, by the book, but hopefully I got things done, you know, my way. And, you know, I think the, the crowd appreciates that. And, you know, a few of the Ferrero boys always used to muck around with me and, and say, you're the cult hero and stuff like that. So it's... um. <laughs> And then, yeah, no, it was just, it was, it's just good to, to come back to my hometown and play for Fremantle and hopefully, you know, put a few smiles on, on supporters' faces. Yeah, obviously, um, as you said, it was a bit of a turning. In 2007, obviously, with that Anzac Day clash, and I think you were definitely unfairly maligned in, after, obviously, there was all the talk about the kick across the target yeah. lock. Yeah. Um, how tough was that 2007 for you? You know, obviously, once that happened, you didn't... I mean, Mal Michael came into the club. Yeah. You were sort of probably played out of position a little bit anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, how, hard, how hard was that year for you? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was really tough, to be honest. So, I mean, I was only 20, 21 at that stage and kicked across the face of goal. And Lockie kicked the goal. And apparently, I couldn't play footy after that. So, I think I only played one more game for Essendon or maybe two um, more games that year. And then, and then I got across to Fremantle. But for a young kid, you know, in Melbourne by himself, didn't, you know, family and friends are back in Perth. Newspapers having a go at you, TV having a go at you, um, you know, support, you go to get a coffee and they're having a go at you. And for a young kid, you know, I, I feel sorry for the for the guys these days because they get probably more scrutinised than what, what I did. But it was tough and, I, you know, I, to be honest, I probably didn't really like footy that much that year and, and it probably showed with my performances after that. As I said, like, it was just good to come back to Fremantle yeah. and, um, you know, really, really you know, be with my family and friends and, and, and really turn... You know, probably people were saying that I was no good to, you know, a guy that tried hard and tried to do yeah. the best thing for the club for Freeman. Or so it was. Yeah, it was. It was a good. It was a good way I finished, and, and I think I hopefully repaid Fremantle back for, for picking me up. Yeah, I think. Oh, I mean, obviously they wouldn't have kept you on the list for as long as they did if they didn't feel that. that was nice. Do you feel you were let down a bit by the Essendon coaching staff during that period? Obviously, it was one thing. Yeah. And obviously, if you look at it today, the turnovers are constant. And maybe it was the magnitude of the clash or whatever it was, but do you feel you were sort of let down a little bit, especially as you said, being 2021? 20, yeah. You know, these days people say, oh, we want you to cross, the, you know, move the ball across, take risks, and as soon as you do it, turn over, then you get dropped. So yeah, it's yeah. a bit. Do you feel it was sort of? No, a... not really let down. I mean, I would have liked to have had a, a bigger, bigger um, go at, you know, in the forward line or something like that. But back line was where I was, you know, earmarked to play, and I, I did enjoy my time at Essendon, and it wasn't their fault that, you know, the the, the you know, I was getting scrutinised out, outside the club for, for my kicking, but no, I I, um, I I got treated fairly there, mate. I've got nothing, you know, bad to say about them or anything like that. But it was just nice to to, to come back to Freo and play in a position I was probably more suited to. And yeah, it was good. Yeah. Do you feel like do you feel there was many differences between obviously Essendon had a lot of history, a lot of tradition, obviously a lot of success with 16 flags, and obviously Fremantle, newer club, limited success. Let's be yeah. honest. Do you, did you feel there was a massive difference between the way the two clubs were run at the time? Or is it just, or as I said, is it more, um, obviously, having the 10 teams in Melbourne as well? Yeah. Did you feel it was a, like a completely different sort of uh, I mean, a lot more relaxed over here. I mean, there's only two teams, so, you know, it's over there. It's, you know, Melbourne is probably the heart of footy and everyone loves their footy over there. And um, so uh, to come back over here, it's a little bit... A little bit more relaxed. Essendon had a lot of culture, but Fremantle wanted to make their culture, so they they kind of striving for the same thing. Everyone wants success. Yeah. And when I came across, you know, Fremantle had limited success, and you just got to look at the last two or three years, and you know they're really starting to motor along and playing finals and grand finals year after year. So you know I don't think Fremantle will be happy until they win that first premiership, but um, they're they're certainly working towards it, and I don't think it's too far away at all. Yeah, you played with some great players both at Essendon and at Fremantle. Who do you think was probably the best player you played with? Like, if you looked at all of the... I mean, obviously, you had some terrific players at Essendon during yeah. that time, and obviously Fremantle now. Yeah. Um, who do you think was the best player you played with? I, to this day, I still think probably Matthew Pavlich um, and then and then Aaron Sandlands um, second, probably because I got to see them both in their prime when I yeah. was at Essendon. You know, Lloydie was coming to his end of his career, and I think Hurdy was only played the two or three years while I was there, so he was coming to the end, so I didn't actually see them in, the, in their prime, but definitely Matthew Pavlich, and then I'd have to say Aaron Sandland second, um, yeah. but I think, you know, if I was a young kid coming through now, and you, you just want to probably play with Fifey, so yeah. I think he's going to be an absolute superstar, but um, yeah, probably the best that I've seen in their prime is probably Pavlich and Sandland. Yeah, it's funny, like a friend of mine, he's got a you know, young son in Melbourne, they moved to Melbourne, and he's obviously used to wear his five jumper to training, yeah. like at Auskick in Melbourne, and he was the only free jumper within miles. Where, but now all of a sudden I was They're talking to his dad right. the other day, and 
you know, you're starting to see a lot more Fremantle support. And I think even like on the weekend in the game at the Western Bulldogs, they seem to be getting a lot more away support now than they've ever had. So yeah, the club's okay. obviously growing as, and, you know, success obviously does that a bit as well. Absolutely. And when we, you know, we played in the grand final a couple of years ago, you know, we played Hawthorne and I reckon there was more for our supporters and Hawthorne supporters just to see a purple going to the games. Um, it was unbelievable. So they're, they're definitely doing something right in, in Melbourne and other states. You had some, you know, iconic coaches as well in your time with obviously Sheeds, Harvey and Lyon. Who, was, who do you think was, you know, obviously they all have different strengths. Who do you feel was the best coach for you as a player in your time at the um, in your right. AFL? Oh, definitely Ross Lyon. He's proven to get the most out of people. You know, Ryan Crowley, Clancy Pierce. You can go through the whole list, but yeah, he's got a he's got a way with people that he can get the best out of everyone and, and make everyone strive for, for you know the same thing. So definitely Ross Lyon was you know huge for me when he came across. And as you said, if I hadn't done my knee, hopefully I would have played a few yeah. more games under him. But uh, I felt like when he came across, I started to play some some really good footy and you just got to look at the other players that I mentioned before and they're playing really good footy as well so he's obviously doing something yeah. right. What do you think was the big difference between Harvey and obviously there was you know talk about him and obviously it was a contentious decision at the time to remove him and put Ross Lyon in what do you feel was the big difference between Harvey and maybe Lyon as a as a coach at that you know. At oh, I think he proved at St Kilda that Ross you know probably took a team that wasn't that great to a couple of grand finals so I think Fremantle identified that and got him across and, and he hasn't let us down he's you know, taking Fremantle, who was probably missing the finals to, to a grand final, and um, they're playing, you know, obviously on top of the ladder this year. So um, I think Freo knew what they were getting when they got Lyon, and, yeah, to his credit, he hasn't let let, let them down, and hopefully he can go one better this year and, and, and win them the, the big prize. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the club's certainly going in the right direction and, you know, being undefeated, and as you said, all those players sort of... When you've got a player who's on the edge, like, you know, you've got these young guys that feel like Mzungu, that sort of thing. What sort of things does Lyon try and do to, like, you know... Does, is obviously communication is key. Yep. You know, they obviously talk a lot about being the seat on the bus and yep. being there, do your role, you stay in the team if you don't, you know. Yep. What sort of things do they do, like particularly Lion does, with those guys who are just on the edge trying to get a seat, yep. you know, and um, in that regard. It's all about consistent performance. I mean, you know, you got to play hard, hard, tough footy and, and consistent performance. There's no point going down, back down appeal and, and not getting a kick and then cracking it because you're not getting a game. So I think all the boys know that when they go down appeal, um, you know, they, they, they chuck their jumpers on and they... They run around like madmen, really, because you really want to play AFL. So I think you know you just got to look at Mzungu's performances in the last three weeks for for the reserve for Peel, and obviously he's trying his hardest to, to get in the team. And not only is he getting his you know 30 odd touches, he's, he's tackling and and doing the hard stuff is is, is what um, you know Ross will probably be looking for. So yeah, when whenever you get when you when you get dropped and you play down at a lower level, uh, that's what they're looking for: effort, you know, yeah. hard at the footy, and, and, and just don't let your team down and. And, and don't don't crack the shits because you're down there. Just yep. go down there and do your job and be hard at the footy. I'm pretty sure you guys have played Peel this year. Who do you feel like, obviously, they look a little bit better balanced this year because they obviously drafted like Blakely and yep. Lockie Weller and that sort of thing. Which of the um, draftees have stood out to you? Obviously, you've been able to see yep. them a little bit more close up than um, even the guys on the fence. Yep. Yep. Has any of them really stood out for you? Uh, I, I reckon Alex Pierce is going to be... I actually played on him and he, and he towed me up. So I, I think ever since he got through the door a couple of years ago, I, I kind of said, I think I actually said to Ross that he's, he's one to look out for. So he's he's a key defender and he, he's just sensational at his positioning and he's going to get stronger and, and, you know, hopefully he can be the next Luke McFarlane. And there's another kid there that, you know, I, I looked at and thought, wow, he's going to be pretty good. He's kind of Blakely. I, I haven't seen, I haven't had a lot to do with him. Didn't know where he was from. And, and when we played against him, I thought, you know, that kid, could be anything, so they're definitely drafting the right way, and I think they've got a couple of kids in the in the, in the field running around that are going to be absolute superstars. See, Alex Pierce has just got his chance the last couple of weeks, and he, as you said, he certainly hasn't looked out of place out there, and he does have that little bit of like that ability of like Fletcher just being able to reach over the top yeah. and do that sort of thing. So it's you know it's obviously good signs. Do you think it, um, obviously with the advent of free agency, do you think it's important if we look at a guy like Alex Pierce, he sort of goes well. You know, my time's coming, but all the talk about obviously Alex Rance or someone like that potentially coming across. How do you think it is with a with a footy club or with these younger players now? If they sort of, you know, even for someone like Alex, yes, and then you've got someone like maybe if Rance comes in who's sort of going to take his position, so to speak. Yeah. Is it you know? Do you think free agency's made it a lot tougher for those younger guys coming through? Oh, not 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 really. I mean, when you're at a good club, you want to stay at a good club. Um, I don't know too many people that would leave a good club to go to a you know an average. You know, yeah. below par clubs. So I think as long as Fremantle keep on the same track, they're going to keep all their players. It doesn't matter who who they are or what they're doing. You know, they they get treated well down there, and obviously they're 
performing well and playing well. So, um, you know, it's going to take a lot to take a young kid like, like an Alex or someone like that away from, from a great club like Frio. So I think uh, with the free agency stuff, as long as your club's doing the right thing by the players, you know, I don't think too many players would leave that certain club. Yeah, absolutely, and it's um, as you said. I think the only one we've free I've really lost in the last few years was Dylan Robertson, obviously, with, and that was probably more outside with family issues you yep. know, with his baby and stuff. So, you know, all the talk about player retention, as you said, obviously they've managed to turn that around, and uh, you don't see many players wanting to leave, which is fantastic for the absolutely, club. Yeah. Just about every player you speak to um, from Frio or you know ex teammates. Who's the funniest teammate you've ever played with? Who's the best joker of the club? It's always your name always comes up. So in the other side of the street, who's always the you know Bellas? I know that you and apparently you and Bellas had a bit of a you know <laughs> bit of to and fro in the uh, practical jokes. So it, I mean, who is the who's that sort of player for you? Who's the funniest sort of guy you played with in your time? Uh, in my time, the funniest guy I've ever played with is probably Scott Thornton. Uh, for the guys that remember him, yeah. um, he retired a few years ago, but yeah, just a real dry sense of humour and. He's got the ability to tell the funniest joke ever and, and, and not laugh at it, which is which is pretty funny. But, um, yeah, a few of the older guys, if you ask them to, they'd, they'd say Scotty Thornton. Um, yeah, but uh, obviously for fun around the club, you'd say Hayden Ballantyne because he's, he's the one that's, you know, doing all the jokes and pouring water over blokes when we're in the toilet and stuff like that. So he's always finding ways to annoy people. And, you know, uh, 80% of the time it was me when I was at Prio, so... Yeah. Um, no, definitely them two have stood out, and yeah. um, you know, it's, it's what you need around the club. It's you know very serious these days, but there is a time to have a joke and a laugh, and and blokes like that provide it. You're now working outside of footy. Do you think it's like there was obviously an article by Grant Thomas the other day about talking about AFL players just spending too much time at the footy club, not doing anything outside of footy. And I know Fremantle do try and, particularly these days, get players either studying or doing something outside of footy. Yeah. Do you think it, do you think it's probably gone too far the other way where they should be doing like every player coming in should be doing something outside of footy? I think, yeah, at Fremantle, they definitely do that. So I think that's not an issue at, at Fremantle Footy Club. I can't talk on behalf of the other footy clubs, but definitely on our day off, you know, Ross would, does, well, he, he won't play you if you don't do something outside of footy. So definitely at Freo, everyone was doing something, you know, and, and I think you really do need to do something other than footy. I think Grant Thomas is right. you really got to, you really got to set yourself up life after footy and, um, you know, um, I think most players do do that, and I think you find now when players do come out of the system, you know, they're they're, they're going straight into the workforce, and, and um, you know, they're, they're not in limbo for for a year or two, and and um, struggling with money and all that kind of thing. So I think I think the AFL as a whole is getting really, you know, better at that, and you know, they're providing the study and 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 you know the the um, the benefits for that. So uh, I think I think definitely Freo are on the right track, and, and they do let their players study, which is. Yeah. So outs- obviously when you're not at footy or at Claremont, what, what interest do you have outside of Is there anything that interests you outside of footy? Or uh, oh, I absolutely love cooking. So I yeah. actually take a few of the guys in the Colts that you know a, a, a might, might one day hopefully get drafted and I take them to my house and we go and cook pasta and pies and tr- just try and cook some really healthy stuff for them. So when if they do find themselves you know, at a club or, or even you know the guys from Albany that travel up and they can actually cook themselves a meal. So um, I actually like cooking, and I try and incorporate yeah. that in, in, in my job. So cooking and golf, mate, so I don't, I don't yeah. take too many players for golf. But, no, um, no they're definitely cooking's an interest, and, and golf's definitely an interest outside of oh, no, all, that's all of that. So. Yeah, oh, great. And do you, like, just, uh, do you see that, like, if it doesn't work out in footy, can you see yourself doing something in that cooking area? I've always, I've always wanted to own a cafe, so I've done my barista course and a few uh, small business course as well, so that's definitely you know an avenue that I, I wouldn't mind doing. So um, yeah, I mean that's up my sleeve, and you know I just got to find the right location and you know yeah. the right staff and all that kind of thing. So yeah, I, I, I'd always love to do my own cafe yeah. and, and you know be helping out in the kitchen and stuff like yeah. that. So when you're a player, obviously at SMA and Freo, did you always have the same nickname all the way through your uh, for no, career? No, my nicknames changed. Changed a bit, yeah. yeah. No, nah, you know, Kev, and then when I got to Frio, it's the fridge. So yeah, yeah. I and mean, how, oh, they got they got everything. Kev train, yeah. anything to do with Kev, they just added anything on the end of it. So. so how did the fridge come about? Oh, I was, we were on a plane on the way to play Port Adelaide, and um, one of the Frio supporters that were caught the plane said to Reese Palmer, "Oh, is the fridge plane?" Reese Palmer's like, "Who's who's the fridge?" And oh, yeah, you know, Kev Bradley, he's the fridge, the big boy. And I was like, so obviously Reese got up in front of the group and said, "My name's the." You know, nickname's the fridge now, so 
ever since then has been been the fridge. One of the things that they don't talk about a lot is doing rehab. Um, and obviously, I think because you were at the same time with Anthony. Yep, yep. You've been and doing John that. Griffin, yeah. And John Griffin, yeah. yeah. I mean, how tough is it for those guys? You want to play footy, that's why you know you're out there. How tough is it is the rehab? You know, even though there's three of you there, which yeah. But it still must be. You know, how tough is the rehab on those? You know, those guys. Absolutely. Well, that's half the reason why I retired. So you know, the it's it's not good to have, but it was good to have John with me, even though I wish it didn't happen to him with his knee, but. Um, he really helped me out through that period, and, and hopefully I helped him out too. So yeah, it's just a lonely place, you know. The, the boys are out, you know, on the track running around and playing games, and you're stuck inside on a bike or, you know, doing some weights on your legs and stuff like that. So um, you do feel a little bit away from the group when when you're injured, and that's why last year when my hamstring started to go a little bit, and you know, I was in and out, in and out, didn't really string that many games together. I thought, you know, it's it's not real. You know, fun for me anymore, but um, yeah, I mean, you just got to look at someone like Morabito, who's done his knee yeah. three times, and 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 he's still plugging away, which you know it, it just shows the credit credit to him to, to keep on going and the resilience. But hopefully, you'll see more eventually find some treatment that will get him up there. You know, and even like Jaden Pitt was another one, you know, with his heart and yeah, that sort of thing. Exactly I mean, right. they've been a bit um, you know stiff and that sort of thing with it. What's your favourite footy moment? You know, playing finals and that sort of stuff. Have played in the. You know, arguably the biggest class they say outside of the grand final with the Anzac Day. Yeah. What was your favourite footy moment of all? Uh, favourite footy moment was probably oh, probably the MCG game against Geelong um, in a final. So we went over there and no one really rated us. And I think you know Geelong were odds on favourites to win. And we went over to the MCG and, and, and won our first final away from home. And um, the way the boys played that night, it was it was just it's, it felt like a dream. So that's that's probably the most memorable moment yeah and do you have any regrets at all in any in, in your time in AFL anything that you sort of like you know as you said any anything you, you wish you went back and did differently or uh, oh not really I mean you know if I, if I look back and my effort wasn't there I'd, I'd, I'd be a bit disappointed but um, you know probably my skills weren't weren't a highlight of mine but you know I leave I left the game thinking that you know more often than not I gave 100% and um, you know on, on the field and on the training track and and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll walk away with, with my head held high and, and pretty much no regrets. When you got drafted 11 years ago, 193 centimetres, you know, being a key position player at that height, you look at today's player, obviously you ran, you know, players obviously your height playing in the midfield and that sort of thing. Yeah. Do you feel that, you know, and obviously like, you know, going back to even that game against Carlton a few years ago where, you know, you did a little shimmy around uh, Juddy and that sort of thing and kicked, you know, yeah. do you feel that you would have probably been drafted in a different position today? Like, obviously, because you had the athletic ability yeah. um, to play probably wing or something like that. Yeah. Do you feel you would have played in a different spot today? If you uh, really probably tried? my speed's not there, mate, to be honest. But, you know, in Colts and, and um, in, in, uh, at West Perth in the league side, I, I did play on the wing and half forward flank um, as a higher half forward basically as another midfielder so that that's the way I used to play my junior footy you know I was, I was pretty good at it um you know I, I still to this day think that I'm a midfielder stuck in a you know a tall, taller body and um you know if, if I did have a bit more pace and probably I you know I, I, I might get a run through the midfield these days but you know my pace probably isn't there for for a midfield player and um yeah I, def, I definitely think you know uh, I'd be a, you know, probably a forward you know still but um you know, they're, they're, they're drafting taller and taller and, you know, more athletic blokes and faster blokes than ever now. So you just got to look at a, at a Fife and a Mundy and, and they're quite tall and midfielders. So, yeah, I think that's that's the way, that, you know, the footy's going to go these days and, and they're going to be, they're only going to get taller and taller and fitter and stronger and faster and all that yeah. kind of stuff. That's why I think it's really important for people like yourself who are working at that waffle level for those kids to be able to, you know, and I think it's really tough and I think it's fantastic for guys like Lockie Neal who are probably pigeonholed into that too small, yeah. not good enough, and Louis Taylor last year. I think it's you know good to see that players who aren't necessarily six foot two, six foot three can still be able to have an impact at AFL level as well. Absolutely, and Michael Barlow's proven that it doesn't matter how old you are, you still a chance to be drafted. So I think you know if you're a footy player out there with a bit of skill and, and you know a bit of work ethic, you, you just keep keep cracking into it and you never know what's around the corner so it doesn't matter what size shape you are if you can get that footy these days and you have a bit of a footy brain more often than not you'll get on a list yeah absolutely is there anything like um obviously when i was sort of over when i watched the geelong game at simmons stadium this year and obviously saw a lot of the ex-players there you know like i think it was peter bell norish spider and they must have had the ex-players club or something over there do you um still keep in contact with a lot of those sort of ex-players or do you head down to the club much these days or yeah i, I keep in touch with a few current players and and Definitely 
ex-players that, you know, Anthony Grover and Scott Thornton, Andrew Seeger, blokes like that, Peter Bell, Manus, you know, the, the list yeah. goes on, Troy Cook. You know, I see them on a regular basis. I couldn't go that day because I think I had footy. But, yeah, um, yeah I definitely get an invite to, for the past player, um, yeah. you know, luncheons and stuff like that. And, you know, I will endeavour to get there when I can. But, um yeah, definitely. You've got a bond when you when you leave a when you leave a club, and you know you, you want to keep in touch with them because you know they're all great blokes, and you've obviously spent a lot of time with them all. So um, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, keen to catch up with them, and you know when we have functions and that, try and endeavour to get there. Do you think that's one thing the club is doing better? Because I think you know early on in the day there wasn't probably. I mean, no, the club's young, but there didn't seem to be that same sort of camaraderie after the playing careers are over, and I think. From all accounts, that they are trying to make a much more concerted effort with that. Yeah, um, well, yeah, well, I can't comment on yeah. the on the you know what's happened yeah. previously, but yeah, they they are making a concerted effort to, to get us all together and you know watch watch a couple of games together, which which is good. You know, I'm I'm all for you know, a bit of camaraderie yeah. off the field, and especially yeah. <laughs> when you're retired. So yeah. you know, I'd like to sit down and have a couple of beers yeah. with, with yeah. them boys and, and even meet guys that I've never played with before, but have played with Freo. So that that'd be a good opportunity in itself just to sit down and. And have a beer with them, and, and and you know watch a game of footy. With the pathways, even for coaching now, do you think do you think it'll ever get to the point now where, obviously, if you're not a um, like an ex AFL player, it's very very difficult for players to sort of get into that system, or you know just guys who are coaching. Obviously, yeah. Simon McPhee, who was one of the coaches at Claremont here, obviously he's now doing a bit of work development coach at um, St Kilda. Yeah. Do you think obviously being an ex AFL player? is going to be able to open those doors much faster for you? or oh, I think it's a benefit because you've been in that system and you know what the system's about for, for a long time. I mean, um, you know, basically I've had 11 years of ex- work experience there, to be yep. honest, um, and you can just see how they work and, you know, what, what the commitment and, and what you're required to, to do each week. So um, I think it, it does help, but it doesn't get you the job. Um, yep. You know, there's there's definitely coaches out there at Waffle Ranks, you know, that, that, that win a couple of premierships and they're, they're straight in. So, there's definitely ways and means to get there. It's just how you get there. So, you know, obviously, you know, playing AFL doesn't guarantee you to be you know, coaching the AFL one day, but hopefully, you know, I can prove my, myself at, at waffle level, hopefully, and um, get an opportunity later on down the track. Yeah, no, and I said hopefully that um, you will get a chance to do it. Ideally, to stay in Perth with obviously your family, friends, that sort of thing, or yeah. are you prepared to travel if, if need be to? Yeah, obviously, oh, obviously you prefer yeah. to stay so in Perth, but, yeah. but, you know, if something did pop up, you'd have to consider it. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm in, I'm in no rush at the moment. I'm pretty happy with what I'm doing, but if something was to pop up, I'd definitely consider it. You talked about Pav and that sort of, and Sandy probably being the best players you play with. Is there any players like that you played against that were, who was your, probably your toughest opponent when you when you were playing? Like if you, every week you go, oh, you know, I'm, I know I'm going to be in for a tough, yep. tough day. Oh, uh, you. Jonathan Brown was pretty tough. Yeah. <laughs> so I'd, I'd, I'd probably have to say Jonathan Brown, um, you know, just his work rate and, yeah, the way he crash packs and stuff like that and, and the way he demanded, you know, his players to, to do the right thing. He, he was definitely one of the best opponents I've, I've come across. And a, as a defender, I would have to have to probably say, uh, when I was playing in the forward line, uh, who was... Oh yeah, Darren Darren Glass. You couldn't get a kick on Darren Glass. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was quite happy when he took Pav or you know, if Pav yeah. wasn't playing, he'd he'd take, have stints on me. But yeah, definitely you know, as a backman, Jonathan Brown and then as a as a forward, Darren Glass was, yeah. was exceptional. Who's probably the toughest player you I mean, as a Frio fan, most people sort of like you know, Cookie's name comes up quite regularly as being sort of, you know, hard body and um, who do you, who do you feel is the toughest player you played with? Uh, uh toughest player I've played with, you know, I don't really want to say it because he, he's a bit of a Character, but uh, definitely Peyton Ballantyne for for his size and weight and the way he throws himself into contests. Uh, you know, not a probably not a lot of opposition teams like him, and that's probably why because he's so hard at it and and um, you know he, he doesn't shirk an issue. He runs back with a flight. You know, if there's a 50-50 ball there and you know it might be the ruckman 100 kilos, he'll just hammer in as hard as he can. So definitely, he's the toughest guy I've, I've, I've played with. So. As you said, he's one of those sort of, as you said, probably a bit more, you know, like yourself, has that bit of cult-like status, you know? Yeah. And probably Jeff Farmer was a little bit like that too, where, you absolutely. know, if um, he's on your team, you love him, and if, he, yeah. if he's not, you absolutely love yeah. him. So there's a lot of talk about tinkering of the AFL rules, changing of this, changing it. If the, is there one thing that you would change if you, if you if they gave you a choice of changing anything at AFL? Yeah. Is there anything that you think? Sub rule. The sub rule? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. No one likes getting it. Yep. You know, no players like it, fans don't like it, coaches yep. don't like it, you know, probably seen DeBoer get dropped because of it. Yeah. It's just a it's just a 
a thing in the game that we don't need. I mean, I don't, I'm not too sure if it does slow the game down or, or whatever yeah. they're trying to do with that rule, but they should just, yeah, go back to the way it was and, and no red vests. And I think the players and fans and coaches and yeah. everyone will, will enjoy the game a lot more. Do you think they should also cap, like keep the interchange cap or do you think they should just get rid of it? I mean, the interchange cap doesn't really yeah. bother me, to be honest. I don't think it'd bother the players. It'd probably bother the coaches because they'd yeah. have to... You know, to second guess what when they make changes, but definitely the vest. I, I mean, you know, you got to you got to get rid, got to yeah. get rid of it because the players don't like it, and um, you know, it's demoralising for a young kid that you know maybe been his first game and, and comes off you know halfway through the third quarter and gets a red vest and you know doesn't play it or, or vice versa. They they have the red vest and they got to wait you know until the five minute mark of the last quarter to to, to go on and play. So. It's just it's just a rule that doesn't need we don't need it in the game I don't yeah. think and it's certainly demoralising after the game you see the guys running laps and laps yes. on Subiaco absolutely you know, it can't be can't be fun is there anything you change on field like the way that the game's currently played uh, not 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 really yeah. I mean uh, they, they they do a pretty good job it's a yeah. hard job to do umpire in a game and you know I think the game's gone away a little bit from from the rolling scrums that that used to happen and, and blokes jumping on the ball so blokes are making attempts to, to hit the ball out now and and get it into play. So, um, yeah, I, I don't think there's there's too much trouble on the field. Yeah. Oh. oh, that's great. Yeah, it's just good, interesting hearing it from a player's perspective sometimes. Yeah. Obviously, there's, you know, talk about keep the game the same, don't change it. And, it's, you know, obviously you being in the coal face, yeah. it's just interesting to hear from a player's perspective what yeah. is, you know, good and bad about it, you know, because obviously the skill levels in that today are just, you know, unbelievable in yeah. the speed. Like, you know, as you said, like how quick it is. It's, yeah. you know, you don't realise until you watch it, sort of, especially when you go and watch a game live where you see a, Guy get the ball in the back pocket and you know it's up the other end in no time. And, and, hey, it's up the other end, but the guy's also up there as yeah, well. Exactly you know, right, they're yeah. just running so hard, and um, yeah. you know, as you see, the fitness levels are unbelievable. Thanks very much for joining us, Kepler. Yeah. Obviously, I'm um, giving up your time, you know, having a chat about things, and uh, hopefully, you know, for yourself, you know, you get a chance to, uh, you know, ideally for us as well, you know, get back on Freo's list as, as a, in a coaching capacity and yep. um, enjoy your time at the Waffle. And uh, as I said, for those people who haven't had a chance, make sure you do come down and watch the Waffle because the standard of comp is. Uh, Get it's getting better and better and obviously this year it's as close as it's ever been for the listeners out there this year will also be the first year that kepler makes an appearance in the ej Witten legends match so if you are ever in victoria and you want to go along and have one last probably have a look at uh, kepler running around or on the tv uh, he will be making an appearance this year along with another ex frio player in anthony grover hope you've enjoyed tonight's podcast with Kepler Bradley and hopefully we'll have a few more with different players in the future. Bye for now. (laughs) 